body other than the face itself. There are, in fact, four different types of, uh, you know, what we think of as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Very wide, pronounced nose. There was also a very ominous uh, odor. Phase one is to identify opportunities. I walked into a small clearing uh, and less than 10, 15 feet away from uh, this enormous creature and uh, it scared the living hell out of me. Phase two is conducting investigations both of witnesses and locations. The size of the thing, it was, you know, four or five feet across the shoulders. Phase three is profiling research areas, what's there, how they move, feeding, things like that. About eight feet tall, I guess around 800 pounds, it was massive. I had no idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot in the air to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase five is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. It didn't do anything, didn't react. And then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did. I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Hello everyone. Uh, I mentioned a while back, and I can't remember how long because I have so much going on. I, I don't remember yesterday sometimes. So um, <laughs> I had mentioned that I was going to be making some big changes to the podcast. And one of the things I wanted to add to it. Now, we're still working on a lot of the uh, the formatting and things like that, the, the big changes we're going to be doing. Uh, and they're going to be very good changes. But I wanted to um, add an additional, you know, type of show to uh, subscribers every week. And Brian and I discussed yesterday about maybe recording with him doing like a question and answer session like we do and we're getting ready to do brands with me today uh, on a weekly basis and I think that's a great idea because lots of people have questions I get questions emailed to me constantly and um, <clears throat> with luck maybe we can you know hit on those periodically and and get people um, the answers they're asking for one of the things we are talking about also uh, with show changes are um, doing live call-in shows and doing those on a somewhat regular basis too because a lot of people want to ask questions directly or talk about things so that's some of the stuff we're we're getting ready to do and um, and like I said Brian and I talked yesterday about doing this possibly on a weekly or, or at least a couple of times a month I, I'm not sure you know how you want to do that Brian but uh <laughs> Oh no! Yeah, let's let's do it weekly if you want. Because actually, as I'm going through your books, it, this is so great. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a great would be a great addition to the podcast. You know, um, doing this once a week. You know, Brian, you always have the great greatest questions. Have a lot of insight. Um, you're like a sponge when it comes to information. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I think that's refreshing. I, I love questions. So. Uh, I guess that's a good way to lead into our, our chat this evening. So go ahead and, and, you know, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Yeah, well, no, I, I, yeah, I, well, on that note, I was just, just going to say that um, being a skeptic or having questions in general is something that I think is important for everybody because it's like, you know, like, like I, I came into this subject a couple of years ago. I, I've never seen, a, a, like, one of these creatures. I've never... I've never been a hunter or an outdoors person or anything like that. So um, it's always good for, like, you know, people that are not familiar with the subject to always ask questions and to get your expertise, you know. And, you know, yeah. what's what's great, too, is I get a lot of people who are professionals 
approaching me now. And and you teach college, correct? Yeah. Yep. So, you know, between, you know, and I, I get a, quite a few instructors, people who are college professors and teachers, uh, surprisingly. Um, and yeah. also, you know, of course, other, other professional groupings, but um, I always like the educators to ask questions because I like to think that educators are open-minded enough to ask questions. Exactly. And, um, yeah, it's kind of funny because I, I, I teach at a college now, but the, the classes that I teach, well, at least, well, th- this next, this next month I'll be teaching at the, at the night, but, um, in the, at actually the college campus, but the cal- the classes that I teach right now are what they call dual enrollment students. So it's actually take, it takes place at the high school, right? So it's like, it's a college class, but it takes like the classes that I teach um, are um, taking place at the high school mm-hmm. and even them like when you when you ask them about the subject it's like well okay I can believe it you know <laughs> and you know what's uh, kind of flattering too for me um, you know I, I wrote my books and put them out there and, and I don't really think a whole lot about them <laughs> now once it's done it's like okay on to the next project oh which I'll, I'll make this pitch real quick before I go on uh, I'm working on volume three of my books, Witness of the Unknown. So if anybody out there uh, has had a Sasquatch encounter and would be, you know, interested in that going into this new volume, uh, contact me at williamjevning at yahoo.com or wjevning at gmail.com and just write out in an email, you know, as much detail as you can about your encounter, how what took place and, and all that. Um you can be totally anonymous, both names and locations. So, uh, anyway, that's uh, something I'm asking everybody if if they'd be willing to do that. So, <clears throat> so moving on, I think I lost where I was going with that. <laughs> um, Actually, I, I was going to say about that too. The the great thing about you as an author and everything is that um, when people contact you, it's like they don't have to like reveal names or anything like that. It, it can be like totally anonymous, which I think is a good thing for revealing the truth. About, you know, about- I just don't think it's important to put the people's names and their, their business out there to the public. I just don't, I don't understand yeah. why people need to have that. I, I, on my YouTube channel, occasionally somebody will write and not too often, but occasionally somebody says, well, what's this person's name? And I'm thinking, why does it matter? You know, it doesn't matter. Exactly. It's, it's a platform for, for witnesses to tell what happened to them, you know, right. to get it off their chest. And, and it does help other witnesses who have never talked about their situations. But, oh, and I remember what I was going to bring up. Um, I, I've had people, particularly, you know, kids in, uh, you know, anywhere from elementary up to high school, uh, periodically write me and, and they, they're doing class projects. So they, they're asking for you know information on doing a, a paper on Bigfoot, and I, I was really honored recently. I uh, was contacted by a teacher in Okinawa on a military base there, and he's actually um, they're doing kind of an ongoing thing with me, and and I'm sending him a couple of uh, uh, Sasquatch footprint casts and, and a poster, and and they've actually got a little information corner that's on Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, and, and it was really nice. They sent me the principal sent me a really nice, you know, letter of appreciation and everything. So uh, it, it's nice to be able to to put to help educate people a little bit. Um, I am supposed to be going to um, uh, the Chippewa uh, Chippewa Indian Reservation location in Minnesota. I, I'm not a hundred percent certain yet that's going to happen, but I, I'm trying to make it happen. Uh, where they want me to uh, give a talk to a group and actually go to the school. So it's kind of interesting, you know, being requested to do things like that. It's, it's really an honor, I think. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, so, that's so funny that you mentioned that because uh, where I went to college is actually in central Michigan, and it was on the Chippewa um, Indian uh, – they're, they're great people. I mean, they're, they're great people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So cool. So, okay. One of the things that I wanted to get your, your take on, um, and this is not from, from your book yet. I, I can get into that in a, in a minute or so, but, um, just in terms of their facial expressions, like how, 
like when you saw that creature, like how were their facial expressions? I I don't know if we talked about that last time last time or not. But. We we didn't that I can remember. But you know, oh. when I had my encounter, of course the lighting wasn't real great, but I, I could still see them. Um, and, and I you know my I had more of an impression. It wasn't necessarily facial expression, but the impression was they weren't happy. Now it may, it may have been just the way they their appearance was, but. Um, I've talked to lots of people that have had all sorts of facial expressions. A lot of times they're not very good facial expressions. Yeah. Um, you know, baring their teeth. And uh, I, I interviewed a guy in North Carolina, a very, very interesting gentleman, uh, a few weeks ago, who, you know, was remodeling his house and went out uh, because of some noises they heard, shined his light in the face of this thing. And it wasn't very far away from him. Uh, next to the dumpster they had, you know, for the construction yeah. stuff. And he, and he said the look it gave him was like, and, and it was holding a deer, a dead deer, and it's in one hand, and, it's, and he said the head was kind of flopped over, you know, his right. hand or arm or whatever. But he said he, he distinctly got the impression that by the look it gave him that he could have been the deer just as quickly. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I don't know if that no, really answers the question, but... Well, no, no, it, it's it's kind of funny just because I, I, I think I read like an account recently where they said that the, like there was one of these creatures and they, they completely killed a, um, I don't know if it was a deer, it may, it may have been some other animal, but it was like the, the creature didn't know that it was being watched oh. and then, and then when it got, when, when it killed it and then it kind of like, I guess, uh, you know, sniffed in the air and it mm-hmm. kind of like realize that hey there's something somebody else here <laughs> and and apparently the the guy looked at the creature and the creature gave him this facial expression saying something like uh you know or basically you know um it was almost kind of a smirk it wasn't like a friendly thing mm-hmm. but it was just like like hey why are you here and then it just kind of ran out like it didn't attack the person or anything like that but it's just kind of interesting how the how the facial um, expressions work with these things, you know. Yeah, and it's interesting too, um, you know, talking to people, even people like Bob Gimlin. I, I asked him, yeah, uh, in a conversation a number of years back. I was talking, you know, asking him about you know uh, his you know encounter, obviously with the Patterson film, and he said he was closer than Patterson was to it actually, and and he yeah. saw the expression on his face very clearly, and he said it was it was. Uh, not very happy that they were there was his his term so uh he said you know he, he said it kind of looked like it was angry or or whatever but you know i've heard that kind of a a thing many many times where it's not a happy expression there uh and even with other members or other sasquatches um there was a couple that i interviewed in alabama some time ago and they talked about seeing this particular creature uh, and it was more, I guess, you know, what you would think of as the Patterson type Sasquatch in appearance. And then right. it was sort of down, I guess, you know, squatted down or whatever. Uh, and, and it did kind of the same thing. It sort of sniffed the air or or, or, heard, or heard these other two creatures approach. And they were apparently a different type of Sasquatch. Um, and it, and he said it got a real disgusted look on its face when it when it saw those two things, and apparently they they smelled or became aware of this first one being there, and they turned around and and went back very quickly the direction it you know they had come. So, and and even I, I don't know if you could get a, a description, not a facial description from the account that uh, Larry Batson wrote uh, from Bob Titmus, a story Bob Titmus told about. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, what he felt he encountered the Patterson Sasquatch, the one that was filmed about three years before Patterson got the film, where you know it sniffed the air. He knew apparently knew he was in the area, but didn't know where he was. Then it proceeded to raise holy hell. So I can only imagine it, it did not have a very nice look on its face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that is interesting. And actually, that's uh, that's actually a good point. So you think that like the different types, like they. Are enemies with each other, or I don't know are, about enemies, but I, I think they probably keep their distance from one another, just like any animals. Yeah, I would yeah. think. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. Um, oh, the other thing, 
and before we get into your book a little bit, um, but the other thing too is that I just saw this recent like report on the uh, effective use of tranquilizing darts mm-hmm. with these with with animals, not just big, but I mean just like just animals in general. And <laughs> there's so much out there that it kind of contradicts one another. Like it's like so like some people say, oh, what, what, why don't you just like put, you know put a tranquilizing dart in these animals and then just kill them but the but the science on that is so off the charts in terms of like how effective it is right and because you, you don't know how much they weigh and everything so it's, yeah you, it's, you have you have to know all those things for it to be effective you can't just put an overdose in there to kill it i mean what's the point of using a tranquilizer just use a gun yeah, yeah exactly. but then again that goes back to the situation like if you take one down you know what's going to happen to you when his buddies show up that aren't too far away Exactly. It, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, not a real smart yeah. thing to to pursue. Exactly. <laughs> but hey, one of the things that um, going through your book, I mean, first of all, this is this is just great how you have like t- um, lots of pictures and uh, images and and, and, and stuff like. And which book are we talking about now, folks? I, I have eight oh. books published so far, so oh. <laughs> I have oh. to ask which one it is. Okay, this is this is uh, notes from the field tracking North American. Uh, Sasquatch. Okay. That, that's the, my the, first one. Yeah, the the orange cover. And you know what? To be honest, I I, I think that I read this before a few years ago, but I'm just kind of going through it again. And um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is how related are these creatures? Do you think to giant gigantopithecus or oh, gigantopithecus? Yeah, yeah. You know. Everything I've read on the Gigantopithecus is they they indicate that it's actually a member of the ape family. So while it could be related, personally I kind of kind of think they're not. Yeah. Because my thinking is that these creatures are probably, um, <clears throat> you know, in the same general family groupings that we are. Now that doesn't mean they're a cousin or anything like that they're not that closely related to us but i think they're more on our side of the fence than they are the ape families yeah 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 because you know that that was one of the things too that they covered on, on one of those uh history channel documentaries is that that um that uh jeffrey meldrum i think <laughs> that he was on he's on everything it seems oh, of like course. <laughs> yeah. but i think that he, he was like saying or somebody was saying that they're probably related to to those creatures but it's but the science on that is is really kind of like all over the place you know my intention with putting that in the book was to simply show um because people you know people always years ago and and i'm basic basing my knowledge from you know knowing john green and renee Hinden and the original people and, and the kind of questions that were put to the subject when they were sort of running the show yeah. And and I think there were very pertinent questions. They were never really answered, in my opinion. Not very well, anyway. Yeah. So, one of the things, I like to be very demonstrative when I'm putting something together. And and people always said, well, there's there's no precedent for something like the Sasquatch. And I, you know, I thought, well, no, that's as wrong as you can be. Yeah. If something did exist and didn't die out really that long ago, historically, um, that grew up to 12 feet tall, was a primate, and and could have been bipedal. They don't really know because they don't have hip or hip or uh, leg bones. But it could have been. But to have something that was, you know, upwards to 1,500 pounds and that tall, and the Sasquatch is smaller than that, then why, if one existed, we know for sure they did, why couldn't the other one? Yeah, and I think that's a I think that's a reasonable question. Yeah, exactly. So that was my whole point. It wasn't to say, well, you know, this is the the forerunner of the Sasquatch. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I don't think they are. But I do think that since we know that there were giant primates, and we have no idea how many there were or are, then it, it certainly makes this question of the Sasquatch's existence viable. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then also, just just kind of um, going through your, your your first chapter here, um, what do you think about Ivan Sanderson's 
uh, book, The Abominable Snowman Legend Come to Life? Or? It was a great book. It, it was one of the first great. ones. I mean, I read Green's books, and then I, I got a hold of Sanderson's book and John Napier's. Um, I thought it was very well done. And, yeah, and yeah. of course, Sanderson was a zoologist also, so he kind of knew what he was talking about. Yeah, and then, okay, so, yeah, John Napier's uh, book called Bigfoot, the Yeti, right. and the Sasquatch, and the mm-hmm. Myth and Reality. Yeah. Yeah. And then John Green's books on the track of Sasquatch. And actually, on, on this note, too, like, what do you think is the big, I guess, flaw um, in some of these authors? And I know they had, you know, great intentions and they were probably good writers. But, like, what is you think that their big flaw was in terms of not convincing the public? Like, if there's one thing that you had to, had to say about that. You know, that's a good question. I never really thought about that. I, I, I think in those times it just wasn't widespread enough. And, and a lot of the things were still put in magazines like uh, Saga and, uh, you know, some of the, like the true crime magazines that were big in the 60s. And uh, there were interesting Argosy, some of those, very interesting. But I think they were sort of viewed as tabloid-esque type publications. Right. And, and I know Green's books, uh, he published them himself. In fact, you know, when you see on there it says Cheam Publishing, Team Publishing was when you when you drive along the Fraser River heading east towards Harrison Hot Springs, you'll go for the longest time without seeing any sort of dwelling or anything. And then you take a this bend in the road, and there's a building off to the right side as you're going towards Harrison Hot Springs. And that was Team Publishing. That was Green's building. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Green went around with his VW van, and he distributed his books personally. You know, he'd sell a few here, a few here, there, things like that. So it wasn't really um, that widespread until, you know, until the 70s came along and there were some of the TV shows that started talking about this stuff. But it really took a long time to uh, get the public kind of knowledgeable that such a thing was even out there. Yeah, and actually, you know, you think about it, a lot of that stuff, too, about why it's become more believable today but also maybe not as believable today might oh, be true re- related is 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 to like tv and and tell and some of those shows that but i mean because it, it was good though that they got that information out there and that that we had you know the the, the gimlin film the Pedersen gimlin film mm-hmm. but at the same time you know you you have a lot of people that um yeah and you know it even took a while for that to catch on i mean I remember, you know, finding the footprints back in 1972 in December, and we had no idea what they were when somebody, you know, my friend John, his dad said Bigfoot. We're like, well, yeah, the feet are kind of big, but, (laughs) you know, I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And the Patterson film had already been out, I think, what, five years at that time? You know, we hadn't seen it. Yeah. It, and that, that's so funny, though, too, because you think about it, and it's like today, in today's culture, 2018, like if there was a video of the Patterson-Gimlin film, like like everybody would know about that. Like oh, instantly. instantly. Yeah, yeah but, back back then, it just, you know, information just wasn't that quick. Yeah. Yeah. So and it crazy. depends on what the information was, too. I mean, a subject like that, you know, back then, you know, when we did, you know, you get laughed out of the out of the house. Um, you know, so a lot of people were quiet about it because you knew what the repercussions were going to be if you talked about seeing something that wasn't supposed to be out there. Yeah, yeah. Hey, also, just looking at this, too, um, uh, what about anthropologist Dr. Pei Wen Chong or something like that? Um, he did, like, a search about, like, he did a research on the jaw, I think. Yes, yeah, so the Chinese scientists have done a lot more work uh, on the Gigantopithecus. In fact, uh, there are supposed to be, I think it's four or six jaws that they found since that time, and um, there have been you know a lot more teeth and things found. So um, I don't know a great deal about you know what the Chinese scientists have been doing. You know, my whole thing was I it was interesting to me uh, because. You know, here you have this giant primate that did exist. Well, 
if that existed, then of course these things could exist. And I sort of moved on beyond that. What, but um, yeah. anyway, uh, you know, I, like I said I, I didn't do a great deal of delving into that the Chinese part. Yeah, no, but this is yeah, v- v- like very interesting, like how you do um, a lot of the a, a lot of the the science and the research and the history behind this. Because that was actually one of my other questions too, is that um, with these other authors and you know I'm sure they're they're really good like John, like Napier and um, and and Renee and everything, but it seems like um, they probably didn't do a great job as great job of, of as you like in some of these books as kind of laying out the the, the science and the research and the history behind it. And, um, well, you know, and, and now to Hinden, now to Hinden's book, well, him and, and, um, uh, Don Hunter, Don Hunter actually wrote the book. Renee, he wasn't, uh, wasn't a writer. So, uh, really was, wasn't much more than what John Green had printed. Um, loved Renee, but he really didn't, he, you know, he wanted well, to have something with his name on it, but he really didn't do anything different. You know, what he did, just like Roger Patterson, I have a copy of Roger Patterson's book, uh, Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist? Uh, Patterson actually had gone to Green's house in 1966. Green let him go through his files and use what he wanted. And when he wrote that book, it yeah. was the same in, the same stories that Green had that he later put in his books. So there was nothing new there. Um, Napier, uh, now Sanderson, fascinating guy, very good information. You know, I loved his book. Uh, Napier also very interesting. Of course, these were, you know, these are old books, so the information is old. Now the stories themselves are always timeless because somebody's account of what happened is, is forever. Um, right. Some of the theories mm-hmm. and things that's, of course, that's dated, but. Um, you know, when Green put his books together back then, they were trying to just show people that, hey, there is something here that's worth looking at. So he just kind of threw all the stuff out there, and there it was. Um, yeah. When I wrote my first book, which is Notes in the Field, and it was it was shortly after Rene DeHinden passed away, that my friend Jack Livingston said, uh, he, you know, we got together, and he says, hey, you, now that Rene has gone, he says, you better start writing because... You know, he's gone. You're the only one that knows a lot of this stuff now. So I thought, yeah. geez, I had no idea how to write. I used to be a prolific reader. My my vision isn't all that great these days, so I don't... It's more of a chore to read than it is doing other pursuits. But um, I used to be a prolific reader. And um, I thought, well, I kind of know how books are laid out since I read so much. So I, I started kind of fumbling my way through doing it. And I thought, well, how do I present this to readers? So I had to put myself in a reader's position and get out of my own head and my own knowledge and, and try to kind of walk people through it and show them that there, is, there are these different stages of the historical background. Uh, and then all the way up to 1950. And then talked about, you know, Green and Hinn and, and the, the Pioneers. And then talk about myself a little bit so people know who I am. And then I, I went into some evidence. Of course... You know, my knowledge has evolved a great deal since I wrote that book, but uh, I started writing that back in 2002. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's that that's yeah. sort of the, that's sort of the the framework of that book. You know, um, kind of a, a sort of a follow up question on that. Um, I think that either we've talked about this before, or I think that you actually wrote about this in uh, in Search of the Unknown. But, and and totally correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it seemed like Rene, at one point, he just sort of, it's not like he lost interest, but mm-hmm. he just kind of like gave up on doing it. So let's, it's like, I think that you said that he, that you invited him to your house to talk about things or to do some investigation and he just kind of like, he was not interested in it or... Rene was a funny guy. I mean, he wanted to absolutely dominate the subject. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and I understand his position because his knowledge at the time was the top. Right. And, and his outlook was the right outlook. 
Uh, uh-huh. And of course, you know, Green and the rest of them. And I, I know what the, the argument was between all those guys. A lot of it was jealousy. Renee was kind of abused by Green, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the photographs and Green using them and, and not even giving Renee recognition in the books for a while for his photographs. So that was kind of their problem. But, yeah, um, yeah Renee did kind of actually. I started getting disillusioned with John Green first. Uh, it became very obvious that Green was more interested in writing and not doing field work or, or learning more about these things. And I was okay with that because I knew Rene was the, he was the field guy. But over time, uh, he was really funny to get him to go out to the field or do something. I used to tell him, let's go to Bluff Creek. It never, never got him to go together with him he wouldn't do it he always yeah. wanted to go by himself uh he always told me he says well there's nothing to see there but you should go <laughs> he told me yeah, that yeah. all the time yeah uh, yeah let Remember, me go let me go waste my time and money you know yeah. but he did start giving up and i don't know yeah. if it was age or um I remember, you know, we, we kind of threw him a, a surprise birthday party for his 62nd birthday. And uh, he didn't know we, we'd arranged for a whole group of people to go up there. He thought just me and my friend Jack were coming up for a, a weekend stay. But, uh, you know, he, he was having fun, but he he was starting to really not... I think he, he was becoming disillusioned because he hadn't seen one. He'd been involved so long, and he hadn't seen one. seen thousands of footprints. You know, Class A footprints. Never saw the creature. Um, when the Ackholt thing happened, you know, I was handing him a front row seat to seeing one or more of these things, and he just drug his heels until the nine... Now, the creatures were in that area for around nine months, and it was almost a daily thing where people were seeing him. Mm-hmm. And I kept telling him, you need to come here. If you want to see one, you need to get here now. And he always kept money in the bank just for a special trip. So he waited until the uh, the creatures were gone. Then he decided to come down. Well, it was too late. So I, I have to wonder, did he really want to see one, or did he want to continue this this mode he was in? I don't know. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Because, um, yeah, I think I remember uh, reading that in, in, her, in her book, and or maybe we've talked about it before, but that, that is kind of interesting that uh like a, a person like that uh involved in the subject for so long would just sort of like lo- lose interest it just and you know and by the early 90s um you know we we got had gotten very close at that time because we we did the big barbecue and potluck at mount st helens and, and had several thousand people show up over the course of the weekend and it, it was a, a big deal he said he was really fired up about it. he says uh, to me and my staff, he said, you know, you guys have accomplished something that no one else has ever done in this subject. Uh, we brought credibility to the subject and drew a large audience. Um, yeah. And then after that, he got kind of kind of odd again. He was sort of, you know, I, I don't even know what, what, what finger to put on it. He was just sort of, I almost want to say kind of lost. Yeah. <laughs> and And at that point... You know, I had too much going on, so I, I started separating myself. I'd already separated myself from the rest of uh, the original people, and, and he and I sort of, you know, we, we did stay in contact, but it was never the same again. Uh, and then, you know, of course, he passed away in 2001, so that's where yeah. I really kind of took off and, you know, did my own thing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Um, well, just switching to topics a minute. Um, how okay? How do you think that? And this doesn't really even necessarily apply to Sasquatch. I mean, I guess this is this applies to like all animals, but just in general, um, with regards to the Sasquatch, how do you think that weather affects them? Because obviously, in the Pacific Northwest, there's a totally different climate than here down in Florida. But they call them the swamp ape, you know, and that's know, totally different. Yeah. My, my observations are the opposite of what you hear most people say. I've heard so many people say, well, the weather must affect their movements and, and all this stuff, and it really doesn't. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that they, 
were, you know, lived through the Ice Age and all that, uh, and were probably very well adapted to that type of a climate. Uh, so what I've seen out tracking these things is, especially around snow, is they don't come down out of the snow. They're always going up into the snow fields, uh, which is the same as what happens in the Himalayas often. Now, the, the Yetis don't live in the snow fields. They live in, in the forested areas below the snow line, but they, you know, it's common for them to go up in those snow fields where it's very cold. So yeah. what I've seen over the years is bad weather doesn't bother them. Yeah, you know, I guess, you know, that actually makes sense because I've heard that with a lot of other animals. It's like they, they will adapt to whatever <laughs> their environment does. Um, I mean, there are, there are basic, like, you know, simple things like, you know, obviously they need water or and a food source, but basically things like that, it doesn't necessarily affect them. I mean, the same thing is true with um, with with um, ocean animals. Correct. Um, they can, they, like like pelicans. For, for or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not uh, pelicans. I mean, um, uh, uh, well, di- well, different animals. They can live in like totally different environments. Right. Right. Um, so it is kind of kind of interesting how that how that works and, and there's pieces of information that sort of allude to that also when you look at uh, look at the old jacko story from 1882 where a, a juvenile sasquatch was captured by a train crew and they, yeah. they kept it in a cage indoors and and they said it would sweat profusely it apparently was too warm you know in in that kind of a setting where these things are used to being out in in cold weather yeah yeah and actually the animal i was thinking of is uh, not pelicans but i mean penguins Penguins, right (laughs) right because yeah they they live in antarctica but then there are stories of them going all the way to like africa and stuff like that so Mm -hmm. um and and they can it's not like they're two different like species they actually are the same species they just can migrate that way right i i think people like to put human characteristics and feelings on animals yeah, you know, and I think they need to get that anthropomorphic attitude, kind of remove <laughs> it from your thinking, and, and exactly. take, take a look, take a look, look at what you know, the kind of situations they're seen in, what the weather's like during those situations, you know, yeah. where prints are found, things like that. Yeah. Hey, here's another question too. Um, how? Because I know that, like, we, like. Pretty much at this point, we agree that they are uh, very social creatures. Um, they don't live together as like one or, or two people. But um, how true is that? Because the only thing is the, the, that I bring this up is because I've actually heard stories lately um, that there are like individual creatures and they, they, they don't live together. And... Um, but I actually have a follow-up question to that. So, like, um, how how solitary are they, or or how social are they, basically? Well, they used to think. Now, back in the time of the original pioneers, Green to Hinden, Titmus, all those guys, Krantz, they all felt that these were solitary creatures. They weren't looking at the big picture. They're actually like all primates. All primates are social, highly social. Uh, it's one of the character, one of the key characteristics of primate species. So these things are obviously a primate. You know, their morphology classifies them as a primate. So we know automatically they're going to be social. And when you look at the accounts and the bigger picture, and I always tell people when you when you have an encounter, you have to expand your view in the area of what's going on. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how many people I have enlightened about what their situation was, that there was more of them present than what they thought based on what they saw at the time yeah so they're, yeah, gonna, no, they're gonna be highly social yeah well I, you know I, I totally agree but the only reason why that i ask that is because i've heard of a lot of animals and again not just sasquatch but i mean just a lot of animals in general where when they think that there's a member that's that's uh you know that that's not going to be efficient if that's the right word whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they'll just disown them 
and then that that animal will go off and they'll have to be on their own for a long time. So I'm just curious as to or, like or what... they could join another group. Now I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, in the area that I worked for a dozen years, um, there were in that whole region three three thousand plus square miles. It's actually bigger than three thousand because I, I I didn't add in the whole Mount Adams area. There's a group over there. There's a group on the western side of that, kind of northwestern side of that whole range. But there are also three individuals. But those three individuals kind of stay together. I mean, they're not even individuals. They they kind of are kind of a loose confederation, for lack of a better term. Huh. And, and occasionally, okay. one or more of those members will, will join with one of these other groups, and then they'll yeah. go off by themselves again. So... You know what dynamic is going on there? I don't exactly know, but uh, but that does happen occasionally. Yeah, that, yeah, that's it. That's interesting for sure. Um, yeah, a couple other things here too. Um, okay, I, I think that we talked about this last time, but the whole like infrasound thing that's got to be dispelled at this point right i mean <laughs> well you know i'll tell you well i'll tell you two things the first part of that is our, our forensic anthropologist friend said that they know very little about infrasound a- at this point so he says in terms of sasquatch having it it's possible now on the other part of that i'll tell you what mr black told me is that they um well, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go too deep into it because, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I it, it's one of these little pieces of inf- information that gets stolen and, and used for me. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, ju- we'll just we'll just say possible, okay? Yeah. You and I'll talk privately, and I'll tell you what he told me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that, that, that'll make listeners mad. Sorry, folks. <laughs> yeah. So, and I guess we're we're probably getting close to the end of time here, but um. Just if there's one thing that you'd like to tell people about this creature that they probably don't know. And by the way, uh, uh, we, we'll get more into your books <laughs> later on. If you, in fact, if you want to do this on like a on a weekly basis, let's let's go ahead and do it, and we'll we'll talk about your books and everything. Yeah, you know but, that's that's what I'd like to do is do a, a weekly uh, yeah. piece, you know, for folks. You know, I, I want to. Now that's something I did want to mention too. Of course, for people listening. Um, are, you know they they're generous enough to to give me five dollars a month uh, for the podcast and and I don't actually get that because I have to pay Podbean part of that but <laughs> um, yeah. I I didn't want it to be real expensive but it does it does help some of the things that I do yeah. so I but I do want to give you folks more content for your five dollars you know and and I want to show my appreciation that way and and doing these chats. And hopefully everybody enjoys the chats and the questions and everything. Uh, and like I said, we're going to be expanding into doing live call-in shows. And we're going to change the format with witnesses too. So to make it more interesting, we're going to have, uh, there's going to be a new intro. And there's a few a handful of people that gripe about the length of the intro. It's only two minutes. <clears throat> but they gripe about it. So we're going to change that. Um, and we're going to try to get some uh preview type show so people can kind of see what's coming up you know some new and i'm not not the one putting it together so i I know a filmmaker that's actually going to be doing some stuff visually uh for what goes on youtube so now for you folks who are the paid subscribers not all the shows of course go on youtube i I appear i put one up there once a week but it's it's from a, a large library of shows so you folks only get all of it there's just you know small pieces that go out to to YouTube, but uh, you get everything. And I'm gonna try to give more on a weekly base, basis to everyone for my appreciation. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, definitely. Well, just, just a couple more questions here. Sure, we um, we get some time yet. Yeah, yeah, and um, again, yeah, we'll definitely. I, I want to go through your books at like each week, like as we as, as I go through them. But um, I guess like one question. A general question about Sasquatch is that what is what do you think, in your opinion, is the biggest mistake that researchers slash experts slash scientists make about this creature? Like, what what is the biggest misconception that they have? About it? <laughs> I, I think the view is that they're 
somewhat, I wouldn't say friendly, but approachable. A lot right. of these people think they're approachable. These things are an apex predator, folks. You you know, uh, like a cougar. You're not just going to go up go up to a cougar and say, kitty, kitty, and get close to it. Uh, it's rare in, in the wild to find a cougar and see one. Yeah, I mean, it was many years before I actually saw one for the first time, but I, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions and about their disposition. These things have a very nasty disposition. They're kind of a nasty creature. It's not something... Um, you want to go after lightly and a lot of these people have very naive uh thinking and approach to the subject and and i'm not saying that in a bad way i'm just saying that they're you know they they think they're experts but it's so far from the truth and it's not a bad thing it's just what it is yeah and and, and it is so funny too that um that so many people like try to have this, uh, you know, like friendly disposition about like for them and <laughs> the, just, for, the forest people. That one, that I get one of the biggest laughs from that. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard of. The forest people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the thing is too is that like Native Americans, I mean they they've known about this creature for hundreds of years, and it's like they. Oh, you still there? weird how there, there's so many people that want to think of it as like you know harry and the hendersons you know <laughs> exactly and and native peoples of course that's you know we've talked about that too it's it's not a uniform outlook um yeah you know and i was told by uh, an elder one time and a chief that it depends on a particular group's experience with these things um you know how old that experience was and, and how it's you know the the views evolved over time so it's really kind of a subjective uh, thing. And that's what used to drive Renee to Hinden crazy. <laughs> I used to ask him about, you know, did you talk to native folks? And he'd say, ah, I don't even want to get into that can of worms. And and I just kind of let it go because, you know, I didn't want to irritate him. But I thought, well, that doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. And then until I started, you know, talking to quite a few different um, native peoples and 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 finding out what... And especially this particular uh, elder in chief told me made a lot of sense when he told me that uh, I thought, oh yeah, of course, it depends on people's experience. That's everybody it depends on their experience with something. Yeah, and you know, um, I mean, because listen, I, I I love Native Americans. Um, I I dated one, and and my my college is, is Native American in general. But this is this is actually a question that I'm not sure. Um, how legitimate the the answer is, mm -hmm. or, or how, how legitimate the the the, uh, the story is. But uh, I've heard stories about like Native American tribes of, you know, uh, they they will tell their children, "Hey, listen, we have to be in our village at a certain point in time because after nine o'clock." That's when the creatures come out, or something like that. Like, absolutely, yeah. I don't know if that's if that's true or how how true that is. Well, it depends on again the area and their experience. I know a lot of places where, um, you know, they they tell them don't don't be out after dark. Yeah, that... and and a lot of the young people kind of scoffed at it. Like, like there was a, an account, a uh, guy interviewed a few years back, um, native fellow. And and he sort of scoffed at the whole thing until they actually saw one. That, yeah, that's that's interesting. Like, uh, I mean, and I I can totally believe that. I guess like there there might be a, a certain understanding that the people and the creatures have. Like, hey, don't don't be out after nine o'clock in our area because we're going to be hunting, basically. Uh, well, and in some places they would take people, you know, and and oh. Yeah, you know, yeah. of course, you know, I tell people consistently, you know, you're talking, uh, you know, in terms of sunset, plus or minus an hour of darkness and sunrise. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those are the times that are very active. You don't want to be out there messing around during those time periods. And, and we've got a number of situations going on currently that fit that model exactly where things, bad things have happened. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and then just a couple, uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll get into your, your books maybe next week or whatever. Sure. But, but um, 
yeah, maybe just a couple other questions here. Um, well, okay, here, here's a good question. What would make your books better than others that are out there? Um, I mean, we, we all know that there are, you know, different podcasts and <laughs> a lot of scammers. To be honest. <laughs> well, I guess, but, I guess it depends on the book. Um, yeah. My my witness and it's it's kind of and I left it so it could turn into a series if that kind of information came in and I do have enough for a couple more books at least uh, the witness of the unknown books those are people's accounts that they written to me and I put them in there you know and and try to keep sometimes keep out their names and, and locations when they've asked but yeah. uh, it's it's their story in their words. And, and I think that's very important instead of changing or, um, you know, some people when they interview, they just lead people. I don't think you, you can't lead people and get an effective interview. Uh, the person telling their story, and occasionally they might ask a question if I think yeah. it's pertinent. Most of them I just let people talk. Um, my book, In Search of the Unknown, of course, that's uh, my first approximate decade in the subject because people are always asking me and I, to be honest, I got kind of tired of answering the same things over and over and over again. So I thought, well, I'm just going to put it in a book and tell them, okay, here's the book, read the book. Um, Haunted Valley is about that particular investigation. Um, yeah. The Minnesota Iceman, nothing was ever put, uh, there's a lot of information floating around out there, but it all it was never all put together in a book. So I, I decided I wanted to do that. Um, yeah. Bigfoot Fieldwork 101. That's a good starting book for people if they want to if they want to get involved doing this stuff. There's a lot to it. It's not just you know throwing your your camera in the car and driving out to the woods and walking around. Um, if you want to really, I mean, because you can find stuff, but then what do you do with it? it you know. Yeah. So I tried to help people with that. And then the most recent one is Bigfoot Evidence. A case for the Sas uh, existence of the Sasquatch, and and that was um, put together. If, if the idea was a friend of mine who's an attorney, he's actually a judge now, um, and and I I didn't I started out thinking well we'll do it from a trial perspective, and I thought you know people are going to get bored with that really quick because of all the minutia that goes through a trial process. So it's based loosely on a trial setting, but it's just it's just the presentation of the evidence because people always say well if sasquatch is real how come there's no evidence well there's a ton of evidence yeah. um, and, I, and i have the book is full of pictures and, and you know supporting it information so yeah that that's kind of in a nutshell my my books but and i don't know about being better than others um there's a lot of there's a lot of books a ton of books on the subject most of well, them i personally don't like yeah, no. Well, if if I can answer that question too, yeah, it's that I think that <laughs> that uh, you're like even just looking at this book right now, like the the science that goes into it, and the general information, and the fact that uh, <laughs> you're not a scammer or like a lot, a lot of people are out there, you know. Um, I think that that's that's a good reason alone for for um, you know buying your books and. Uh, and so forth. So, and I can tell people, you know, it, as a, as an author, you don't make a lot of money. I don't make a I don't make much money with the books. Uh, yeah, it was more to be informative and 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 it's kind of now that I'm, I know how to do it, you know, and I can I can do one pretty quickly actually now. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of fun to have one out there and give people some information. But in terms of making a lot of money, no, nah, I I make hardly anything. I mean, I've had months where I've made ten bucks. <laughs> off sales you know so other months have been much better but um i, I don't make thousands of dollars i i saw a youtube video uh, on self-publishing and uh this young lady was talking about how she made all these fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars i'm thinking geez what what did you write where are you selling them <laughs> how did yeah. you get that to happen because i'm sure the vast yeah. majority of us certainly make nowhere near those kind of numbers i mean that's just kind of <laughs> kind of crazy yeah. but yeah but you know no serious on a serious note though it, it is it is kind of a shame that uh there aren't more to, like more really good strong authors like you out there for 
you know, not not just this subject, but I mean, just in general, like people that are not out trying to like scam people, which we see a tons of. Oh, it's horrible these days. Really oh, horrible. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I I really try to be you know above board with folks and 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 just give them give them what other people what people are saying what what's going on what's happening you know people say they want yeah. to be informed but. And then, of course, everybody is anonymous on on places like YouTube, so they can make stupid comments with no repercussions. <laughs> uh, except yeah. on my channel, I, I, the comments have to be approved by me to be posted. So if I see something <laughs> that's dumb, I just delete it. <laughs> cool. So I'm telling cool. people that right up front in case that I put this on YouTube. Um, and and for people who who don't know my stuff, if they uh, you know are, are watching us, if I do put this on YouTube. Um, Go to my website, williamjebning.com, uh, and that's going to be, we're getting some changes on the website here down the road, too. Uh, and my books are all on amazon.com, and Amazon sets the prices. I don't, so I try to keep them as low as I can, uh, but they, they have a requirement, you know, on pricing. So, Right. And yeah. I think it's typically like the length of the book dictates what the price is, so... Um, Anyway, they're on Amazon.com. If you just type in my name, it'll take you right to them if anybody's interested in that. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Well, I think we'll, we're out, out of time. I have a couple other questions, but we can save that for, for next week maybe if okay, you want. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, folks, that's what we're going to do. Um, like I said about all the changes, we're going to be making some changes on the podcast, this being one of them. Um, you know, Brian's always a great uh, person to have a conversation with, great questions. So Brian and I are going to be doing this on a weekly basis along with the witness interviews and um, and then some other additional content that we're going to be adding in as time goes by. And I don't know what time frame that is yet because uh, the friend of mine that's going to be doing the show with me, and I'm going to have a co-host, um, we're sort of waiting on his schedule. So um, good changes coming, you know, stay tuned for that. All right, cool, cool. All right, well, great, great uh, Brian, chatting. Always yep. a pleasure. We'll talk again yep. next week. Okay, sounds good. All right. All right, Thanks. buddy. Okay, take care. Bye now. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining me this week. Be sure to tune in again next week as we explore another account from a witness of the unknown.